Welcome to Bomb Squad Movie Night. Let the games begin. I am your host, Tim M. Sullivan, and with me I have... Hi, I'm Austin Zwiebelman. And I'm Ethan Hawker. And we have two returning guests today. First, we have joining the few, the proud, the four-timers club. Angie Hachiman. Oh! Yeah! And I believe this is my first live-action movie as well. Yeah, it's true. And uh, returning again from the uh, Adolescents of Utana podcast, we have... It's me, Dawn, from the Anime Nostalgia podcast. Woo! Thank All you. Right. And today we have a interesting movie to talk about. We're talking about the 2018 film Animal World. And I'll go over just a little bit of background on what Animal World is. So Animal World is a Chinese live-action adaptation of the manga Gambling Apocalypse Kaiji by Nobuyuki Fukumoto, which is a series that has spawned a two-season anime and a trilogy of Japanese live-action films as well. Oh, it also produced a live-action stage play musical. Kimi nara dekiru hazu da. Soudaro. This was directed by director Han Yan, whose more recent titles also include Go Away, Mr. Tumor, A Little Red Flower, and Love Never Ends. Yeah, since this is just sort of an interesting live-action version of a manga slash anime, I uh, wanted to start with a question that was, uh, what, what are your guys' favorite live-action manga slash anime adaptations? Let's start with Austin. Uh, it's an early one, but for my money, the best live-action manga adaptation is the 1972 sword-fighting film Lone Wolf and Cub Sword of Vengeance. Oh, you motherfucker! That was the one I was gonna do. Ooh, that's a good pick. Nobody can beat the wave slicer technique. No, no, that answer's a lie for me. I haven't seen that. I haven't actually seen that many live-action manga adaptations because I've been too busy watching the Cree Master Cycle reruns on TBS. So I'm going to use my secret technique of giving the most obvious answer anybody could choose. A shameful answer. That's right. I'm choosing the 2003 Park Chan Wook film Old Boy and none of you can stop me. Hell yeah. The film that acted as a gateway drug into the South Korean film renaissance for a whole generation of dumb boys. It's flashy with its corridor fight, it's disturbing with its twist. It has that quote about laughing that film school kids make their Facebook cover photo when they're having a really bad time. What's so funny? Uh, in other news, I think the greatest film of all time is The Godfather, and the greatest song of all time is Stairway to Heaven. Nothing to see here, I'm just an average American who's trying to survive between Madden releases. Back to you, Tim. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, old boy's a great choice. Yeah, that's a good one. I honestly forget that that's based off of a manga. All right, Ethan favorite live action anime slash manga movie? Okay, this one was actually hard for me because there are a lot of ones I like, but the very few that I'm like particularly over the moon for, um, in terms of like Japanese produced live action adaptations, it's gotta be the original Lady Snowblood. I have a lot of affection for that mm. one. I kind of waffle on if I prefer that or the second one, because the second one has some more stylistically interesting stuff going on, but the pace is a little bit more awkward. I think feel like maybe as a whole, it's not quite as tight as the first one, uh, but I really like them both a lot. Special shout outs to the uh, Lady Oscar film, which is a uh, very beautiful Jacques Demy film. Uh, it's not a great adaptation, but Jacques Demy makes pretty movies. And in terms of American-made stuff, it's, it's got to be Speed Racer. Good stuff. But I'll leave that because I'm sure maybe someone will also pick that. So I don't want to give my thoughts on it too much. It's just fun. All right. Angie, as someone who pretty much exclusively watches anime, except for when I sit you down to watch Hereditary or something, uh, <laughs> I, know, I know you were having a little bit of trouble with this one, but why don't you just kind of tell us about uh, the live action anime adaptation stuff that you have seen? Yeah, so um, I had like a little bit of like a crisis because I started thinking about what have I seen? And the only ones I've seen are the live action Attack on Titan movie and then the Netflix Death Note. And both of those are terrible and I am nowhere near my favorite anything. So I was like, I gotta seek out some 
you know, live action. So to make a long story short, I, I found some and I would say out of everything that I've seen, the Laughing Under the Clouds movie was probably the most entertaining despite many variations from the original source material. Uh, it takes place during the Meiji Restoration where there's some sort of unrest between people who don't really like the westernization of early Japan. So it's got like that historical fantasy sort of vibes to it because there's like the whole curse of the Orochi and the Orochi is going to be reborn within a human vessel. So you've got fantasy, you've got like historical, you've got like fights. So it, it's pretty, it's got all the elements for a fun movie, despite the anime being vastly superior version of the story. I at least had some fun watching that. Nice. All right, uh, Dawn, what, what's your favorite uh, live action anime slash manga? Uh, well, if we're going by just adaptations in general, one of my very favorite ones would have to be the live action TV series, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, yeah. which is based oh. off of the original Sailor Moon manga and anime. And it really sticks to the tokusatsu and superhero team roots like really well. Uh, even with the changes they made, it's it's still like, it's got the heart of Sailor Moon and it's just really well produced and acted and written and thought out, even with like so many changes from the original source material. But if we're talking about movies, I do really love the Wachowski sisters Speed Racer adaptation. It's so good. Like they really understood the assignment when they made that movie. It's so good. I also have a soft spot for the French made City Hunter movie, uh, AKA Nikki Larson uh, is what it's called over there. <laughs> it again was made by somebody who is like a huge fan of the source material. And you can really tell like a lot of love went into making that adaptation, kind of similar to uh, the Wachowski Speed Racer. Like they really just got what made that series good and just like played around in that world and the casting was really good. Like there's so many good little Easter eggs and it's just fun. There are others, but I think those are the three that really stand out to me as like really good. But I will give a honorable mention to the Battle Angel Alita movie, which I really, mm -hmm. really like. Hell yeah. Yeah, all, all great picks. Uh, I am going full speed ahead into Lone Wolf and Cub. That one is just uh, it's such a good movie. I haven't read the manga, but like I love the Lone Wolf and Cub movies, specifically the first two, Sword of Vengeance and uh, mm -hmm. Baby Cart to the River Sticks. Both of those are great. I got to see the Shogun Assassin edit at the Late Night Grindhouse screening last year. Thank you, Andy Triefenbach. It was a blast to see on a big screen with a crowd of people. And it was like a mystery movie thing too. So like as soon as you just hear the kid going, when I was little, my father was famous. He was the greatest samurai in the empire. Everyone's just like, yes! <laughs> it was awesome. Oh, I bet. That sounds fun. Do you want to watch a video with me before sleepy time? Oh, yeah. I would love to. Which one do you want to watch? Shogun Assassin. No, BB. Shogun Assassin is too long. Mm -mm. No, it's not incredible movies they went on to inspire so many things including the f***ing mandalorian it's just great stuff mm -hmm. and speaking of great stuff we got a movie to talk about today animal world baby let's talk <laughs> about our thoughts on the kaiji adaptation animal world now, Austin, you have no experience with Kaiji, but based on uh, your messages in the chat, it seems like you had a good time with the movie. Why don't you tell us about it? This is absolutely beating a dead horse, but I too thought that this was going to be a superhero movie about a clown because of the trailer. Tim kept mentioning something called Kaiji and told me that I wouldn't have to deal with researching it for time constraint reasons. And when my husband asked me what Kaiji was, I was just like, oh, I think it's about people who transform into fighting clowns. Uh, forgive me, Tim. <laughs> Oh, good. Instead of getting a film where somebody becomes the Joker, it's a deadly serious remake of the Joker and the Thief montage from The Hangover. 
This is one of those death game movies that Japan exports like candy, but told with the brush of a Chinese filmmaker who's partial to vibrant flights of fancy that punctuate the plot, as previously demonstrated with his earlier movie Go Away Mr. Tumor, which was China's entry for Best Foreign Language back in 2015 that didn't manage to land the actual nomination. Those elaborate dream sequences were probably featured so heavily in the trailer because they really are kind of astonishing to behold. Four VFX houses worked on this film, including Weta Digital, doing their first Chinese release aimed at the international market. Weta is easily the most recognizable name out of the four, and they did the sequence that probably suckered the most people into watching this film, that train bite in the beginning. Functionally, the other VFX house that helped this movie the most was probably Finn Design Plus Effects out of Australia and Shanghai. This movie's death game that takes up most of the runtime is a gambling scenario based on a huge room of people playing rock, paper, scissors and the protagonist has to use, like, advanced mathematics and game theory to survive. And without those motion graphic sequences explaining the college-level math he's doing, things would have gotten ugly on my end. I, I did not understand the math personally, but the graphics gave me a vague enough idea of what was going on that I didn't feel so hung out to dry. Uh, it's very rare that a screenplay requires viewers to comprehend serious math problems, and I'm glad that they knew that and gave us a cutscene to visualize everything. <laughs> a couple things on this being a Chinese film particularly, it seems to make some solid commentaries on the destructive nature of capitalism and the ruling class. It encourages collectivism, while also alluding at various points that even when you work together with people, you have to watch out that they're going to secretly do a capitalism to you, and at that point you <laughs> might just want to beat them up. <laughs> Props to Gordon Gecko for doing a good enough job acting in this, Michael Douglas. I recently watched It Man 3, and Mike Tyson stood out like a sore thumb, so it's good seeing an American actor integrated more effectively into a Chinese film. Welcome to Animal World. Let the games begin! I had a good time watching this, even though it's like two wildly different movies hosting the same party. Both of the things it was pretending <laughs> to be were solid and interesting, and it's more funny than detrimental that the fighting clown stuff happened to be slightly more awesome than the gambling plot. I hope this thing gets a sequel, considering the manga it's adapting had a colossal run, and I'd recommend this exclusively to weebs that are trying to have a good time. Back to you, Tim. Hell yeah. <laughs> Ethan, what are your thoughts on the movie? It's fun. Um, I, I had a good, really good time with it. I'm not really familiar with Kaiji at all, but I do like the sort of formula. Obviously, I'm sure this is this has been reiterated literally a million times. I'm, I'm making no new points here, but uh, the vague reminder of the Duelist Kingdom arc in um, uh, mm -hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh! obviously yeah. <laughs> hit me while I was watching it. And so it's like, I'm, this is something vaguely familiar. The clown stuff threw me for a second because I had no idea. I'm like, I don't think that's in, in the Kaiji manga or anime. I'm, not, I'm completely unfamiliar. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, because it's very fun, though, very vibrant. And I think the way it plays with the sort of heightened reality throughout helps keep people who maybe, like, even with the motion graphics, I don't know, some of the stuff with rock, paper, scissors eluded me a little bit. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm a miserable statistician. So that sort of extra layer of effects on top of things was a lot of fun. I think Kaiji is a fun lead. He's noble and good overall while hiding a bad boy streak. If I were to complain about one particular element, it's that my understanding of Kaiji is that he's a crying wiener baby. Um, mm -hmm. And I and that, that is kind of missed. Here, just because he seems like kind of a dip and I love that, but I also recognize you want to make the film more accessible to a wider audience, which mm -hmm. seems to be the aim of a lot of the integration of more like superhero kind of stuff throughout the film, which I understand. Like, you kind of have to consider the marketability, and the end product is a lot of very fun action sequences and stuff that adds to the overall film. It's a little messy at times, but hey, if you're gonna make a particularly fun, sort of unique movie, it's gonna be messy at points. Mm -hmm. Michael Douglas in particular, as been mentioned, I think he's well served by this role, because it's a lot of, he can, because he is speaking very authoritatively and directly, he just kind of has to be a bit of a ham every once in a while, and speak his lines in a very measured pace. In three days, this ship will set out from Akamata and say, God, oh, I can never say this island's name in one breath. Arakakamaka Bono Island. Right, okay. But I think overall, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, it's made me interested in checking out Kaiji proper. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm excited to check out that. And I would not be opposed to watching an Animal World 2. That'd be fun. It's a good yeah. movie. And I recommend it to folks who are interested in this sort of thing. And I think it's accessible even outside of like the, the anime space. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And you and I both watched Kaiji somewhat recently. What are your thoughts on the movie? All right, so like everyone, uh, the trailer really like throws you off because you told me it was a Kaiji adaptation and I watched the trailer and I'm like, huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> 
So I tried to go into it expecting it not to be like a true one-to-one -one adaptation of the source material, just to not to like, you know, get my hopes up. But it ended up actually being a surprisingly a pretty accurate, for, at least from what I remember, it seemed to be pretty mm -hmm. accurate to the first arc of the story. Yeah. But they did, uh, with some changes, I think they mostly changed the cast. Like the main character, he isn't really like Kaiji from like the manga and anime. But I think that worked. Uh, I really liked the multinational like uh, addition to the story where you got like mm -hmm. people from all over the world and different nationalities kind of interacting together on the ship. I thought yeah. that was a really great like addition that adds like a little bit extra to it. I'm sorry, I don't remember anybody's names or know any actors' names. I did enjoy the old white guy that was like running the game. Yeah, Michael Douglas. Yes, he is so enjoyable. And I think everyone's already mentioned that, but he did have a really enjoyable performance. He was a really enjoyable character. I guess the only thing is that uh, some of the fantasy sequences were a little bit confusing. Like I'm overall, I'm kind of glad that it was sort of like an in his head sort of thing and that there weren't actual real monsters in there because the trailer got me a little bit worried about that but i think i got really confused in the scene in the hospital where he started beating up that patient i thought for sure that was a fantasy and then they start bandaging up his hand and i'm like it really happened what <laughs> So uh, that was just a little bit confusing, but I, I think the special effects and everything looked amazing. Even if I didn't really understand what was going on or why they were inserting those bits, it looked really cool and looked really great. So it was overall really fun, really enjoyable. All right, Dawn, I know you have some experience with the, the film. Uh, what are your thoughts? I watched the film originally when it first came out on Netflix because I was like super stoked to see this adaptation because I really enjoy Kaiji the manga and Kaiji the anime. And so when the trailers came out, I was like, this is supposed to be Kaiji? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> This doesn't look anything like Kaiji. There's a clown and he's fighting these weird monsters. <laughs> like, what is going on? So me and my friend Trisha, who, if you listen to my podcast a few years ago when the manga got licensed, we actually did a podcast episode on it. And she mm -hmm. was my guest for that because she's a huge Fukumoto fan. And so we watched the movie together and we had such a blast watching it because even though they made so many changes, to this movie, it was still super enjoyable and really fun to watch. And we were astounded at Michael Douglas playing the Tonegawa character. <laughs> we were like, wait, wait, Michael Douglas is Tonegawa? Like, it was a weird choice, but it fit really well. Like, he was really good at it. And I thought mm -hmm. the stuff that was added, like the action sequences and the clown stuff, I was like, it's a weird choice, but like, it's entertaining so I don't mind it so much. It mm -hmm. was really weird seeing not only Kaiji having a girlfriend, <laughs> which was uh, like, I get the choice because they were like, well, let's make him more relatable. Like, he can't be a total loser or no one will like him. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I guess. But also the fact that they chose to make him really hot. I was like, this is weird. <laughs> I'm not used to like Kaiji being like very conventionally attractive. Like, I'm used to him being like that weird sort of so ugly he's kind of attractive <laughs> in the uh, the mm -hmm. anime and the manga. Just a little gremlin man. Yeah, just a big pointy gremlin guy who's really sad and you feel bad for him. <laughs> Even though he's a dummy and like all of his problems he basically brought onto himself because he's so stupid. Also making him like some sort of semi-genius with like a lot of charisma was kind of weird. And the whole like, Ooh, I'm crazy, like Joker thing was like a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, even with all of those weird choices, it's still like super entertaining. And they basically kept the first story arc of the game mostly intact. Like obviously there's some tweaks here and there, but it's basically the same. And the ending of that is basically the same. So it was kind of cool that they tried to do a bunch of different things, but the heart of it is still the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And I'm also of the camp that like, I would love to see a sequel of this. I would be curious to see how well it did on American Netflix, because like, I know a lot of my friends who are also into kaiji watched it after I spread the word. I was like, yo, this is like a kaiji adaptation. I know a lot of you might not realize it, but it is, go watch it. And a bunch of people did watch it and they were like, yo, this was weird and it rules. <laughs> But, like, I don't know if people outside of, like, the nerd community ever watched this. Because I would be interested to hear, like, what a non-anime watcher thought of this. Because <laughs> no. if you had no context, you would be like, this is the wildest movie I've ever f***ing seen in my life. <laughs> like, there's a dude that thinks he's a clown fighting monsters from a cartoon. There's a boat that people gamble on and they play death rock, paper, scissors. Michael Douglas is there and he's got a gun. <laughs> like, it's just so much. Yeah, I guess that is, is kind of to the point of I, I wonder if um, it, divorcing it from kaiji as much as possible might make it more accessible. Like, not advertising it as a kaiji film and being like, this is just a movie, um, mm -hmm. not, not, re not related to anything else, so that people could just kind of stumble across it. Yeah, there's a very blink and you'll miss it credit that it's based mm -hmm. off of the work of Fukumoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all, all good takes. Yeah, my thoughts on the movie. I had a good time with it, pretty much echoing what everybody here has said. Like, it's odd, but but it's also just very enthralling. Just all of the different things it's trying to do. Like, I think once it gets onto the boat, it's just like, all right, so this is good now. It's a little more palatable at that point. And like, everybody's brought up the little motion graphic thing. I love that they did that. I think that was a great integration to kind of make it feel more like the anime, but in sort of a natural way that doesn't seem to like force. Because that's the thing you'll see a lot in anime is just like visualizations of things that are going on and like the graphics I think made it much more palatable and much more easy to understand the complex math that's going on. Yeah, like Austin was saying earlier, I was like very thankful to have those because I too am too gay to know math. Yeah, <laughs> Again, Michael Douglas, I think, was really good in his role. And I kind of like how he's not just Tonegawa, he's sort of an amalgam of Tonegawa, Endo, and Yodo a little bit, I think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's just like, this is our big bad right here, Michael Douglas. Even though Endo is in this. Uh, he's, he's the weird cyberpunky no eyebrows guy. The whole clown thing I thought was odd, but I do kind of like how he's visualizing people as monsters because, you know, the whole thing with Kaiji is how it's a lot of showing who people really are when the chips are down. And mm -hmm. so he's just sort of seeing everybody as the monsters that they really are, which... Yeah. You know, it kind of sounds like some weird edge lord shit, but like I think it's portrayed in an interesting way. Like it's still captivating. I do really enjoy the performances here. Like I, I know the guy playing Kaiji or Kaisha is is a it's a different take on the role, but like the heart <laughs> of the character is still there. Like he's still sort of this guy who's trying to fight to survive but like still sort of has that altruism in him that like he doesn't want to screw people over and like they kind of add to that with the whole thing with the mother's hospital bills which i thought was a neat touch makes him a little more admirable i guess um yeah he's like jonochi yeah. in Yu-Gi-Oh, getting his yeah there you go he's he needs three million dollars <laughs> uh for the most expensive eye surgery ever yeah. <laughs> uh, he's played by uh, Yifeng Li. Shout out to him. He did a good job. I liked the take on the Funai character, which uh, his name is uh, Zhang Jinkun. Uh, he's played by Kesu. And like I thought that they took an interesting direction with him by making him sort of uh, charismatic asshole instead of just like a slimy little douchebag. I mean, he's still a slimy little douchebag. Yeah, but he's suave. <laughs> 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 You lose. Betrayal. 
Yeah, I think that there was a lot there that's interesting to watch. If this looks at all your bag, feel free to check it out on Netflix. But right now we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. Say goodbye to Exodia! Every card can be traced. Don't try to be smart. And we're back from commercials, and now it's time for some sponsored content. If you ever watched a movie and thought, this looks so pretty, I want to put the whole thing on my wall in the most abstract way possible. <laughs> well, look no further. MoviePalette.com is a website where you can buy art pieces that contain thin lines that represent each frame of the film with their most dominant color. They're pretty cool. I have one from my favorite film of the last decade, Mandy. So yeah. there's, there's my movie palette right here. Um, so if you want to go to moviepalette.com and use the promo code SQUAD15, you'll get 15% off your order. That's SQUAD15 for 15% off your order. And now we're going to go into some general discussion. So something that I noticed when I was watching it for this will I think be the third time I've watched it was the beginning of the movie really feels similar to the directing technique of David Fincher, like especially like in Fight Club. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of Fincher yeah. when they were doing all the crazy CGI camera moves you couldn't usually do in real life. Yeah, and they kind of tie that in throughout the movie in multiple shots. Like, they kind of go back to it, especially with his, like, inner fantasy stuff with the, mm -hmm. with the clown or the medical stuff or whatever. I thought that was interesting. The budget for this film was $44 million when you convert it. So it was, wow. it was a big one. Yeah, I figured it probably was considering all the special effects and the fact that they kind of made it for like a worldwide release. And also the fact that Michael Douglas is in it. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, he couldn't have been cheap, right? It's yeah. Michael Douglas. I wonder which of his grandkids is like going to college now that this movie was made. <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> I was kind of impressed at how good they made him look younger in the very, very end, where where he kind of is, it's like, oh, surprise. Like yeah. the thing that happened with your mom, he, he was in on it. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I'm like, where's our sequel, Netflix? Yeah. I want to know what was supposed to go on after this. It says to be continued. They need that to be continuous. Yeah. I did that thing that Ethan does where you like search, you copy and paste the Chinese characters from Wikipedia, like the name, and then 2018, oh, yeah. so you can get the Chinese articles and stuff. And I found one about how like the director was like wanting to make a sequel, but adapting like a sequel script for him has been so daunting that like they published this article in 2022 and it's just him saying, it's hard. I'm working on Aww. it. So it's not like it's it's coming down the pipe anytime soon, I believe. I mean, I get it. Especially the next few games that come up in Kaiji, like mm -hmm. that that's gonna be hard to figure out how to adapt something like that. Yeah, especially cause like the next one is the one of them walking on the beams. And uh, this is the part of the show where we address the squid in the room. Huh? Uh, there's, <laughs> there's some very similar aspects of this series to Squid Game. And oh. uh, that game in particular, is very similar to like, it's one of the ones towards the end of the season where they're trying to walk down this thing of glass plates. The creator of Squid Game has said that that was one of his main inspirations. Mm -hmm. uh, like he went absolutely. on record saying he was like a huge Kaiji fan. Mm -hmm. The cinematography was really impressive in this movie too. Like I was kind of surprised at how good it looked. Shout out to the DP, Max De Young Wang. Uh, good, good picture. I have a funny trivia about this movie. So um, uh, apparently Fukumoto is like pretty protective of people who want to adapt the manga, especially if you're going to insert the Joker. And uh, so the director <laughs> had to write a 10,000 word proposal to the manga guy in order to get the rights to make the movie. And also, uh, he wasn't able to get Michael Douglas that easily. He wrote another 10,000 word proposal to Michael Douglas. So it's kind of funny because this Ow. movie feels like it was made by a math student and he used like homework assignments to make production things happen. <laughs> Hell yeah. Another fact is the reptilian creature that the main dude fights was nicknamed Hightower by the Australia based VFX house, Rising Sun Pictures. And they had to change how Hightower looked throughout the movie, particularly for the card game sequence. They were like, oh, f he 
doesn't have hands. So they had to give him hands all of a sudden when he's yeah. playing cards, because, you know. <laughs> Plus cards with his mouth. <laughs> he's going to toss him out there like a dog. He's going to use his wiggly eyeballs. <laughs> The one snippet that stood out to me in particular, of course, was the bits of traditional animation that we see with the clown. Uh, the clown does look a lot more kaiji-y, obviously, because it's, it's a drawing, but with the, the pointed yeah. nose and everything, uh, which is yeah. fun. And, and the hand-drawn animation, uh, what little of it there is, uh, looks quite nice. Like, it's it's clearly using a lot of very, you know, anime-y tricks of um, just moving characters, having them slide up on the screen and everything, but it's fluid, and it's, uh, like much of the rest of the film, it's vibrant and very attractive. The construction of the ship Destiny, uh, that took them four months, and they had a maximum of 350 workers on the set, usually. So that was a big deal, just getting the Destiny ship. And I, I don't know what they're talking mm. about by that, because I just assumed the ship in the wides was CGI. But I think, from reading yeah. the quote, <laughs> that they got an old military ship and, like, spruced it up and did something with the ship. Also, um, I've got some numbers. Uh, this film has, a, like, big international cast with about 400 actors, and 140 of those actors were non-Chinese. One bit that, like, kind of caught me off guard uh, was, like, when they're dealing with that early elimination and he just f***ing pulls the gun and shoots him point blank. Uh, <laughs> right? Because in the anime and the manga, like, they just take the guy to the other room, but he's just like, we don't, we don't do cheating here. Bang! Yeah. That is how it narrowly classifies as a death game movie. I wasn't allowed to call it a death game movie until Michael Douglas capped that guy. It yeah. narrowly makes the definition. Yeah, this was literally the part where the first time uh, my friend Trisha and I ever watched it, we were screaming, holy <laughs> sh**, they gave Tonegawa a gun. <laughs> international waters <laughs> anything goes <laughs> that almost yeah. makes up for the fact that in this version tonegawa doesn't do his infamous fuck you line yeah i love that big old boomer speech just like you stupid kids don't understand what hard work <laughs> can get you i know it's it's so ridiculous but to put more context into it like kaiji came out around the the time of the bubble bursting in japan and during the time when mm -hmm. there was like that 15 and 20 years of stagflation in the economy so the whole thing is basically like how young people had to deal with that feeling of being like totally disillusioned and feeling that their lives were all at dead ends because like all the jobs that were available were just basically go nowhere jobs. And it didn't seem like there was any hope for them. And that's one of the reasons why Kaiji kind of like goes on this whole experience because he's like, well, things are hopeless anyway. So I might as well just do it because what mm -hmm. do I have to lose anyway? I'm a loser. I'm never going to get anywhere if I just keep doing what I'm doing. I might as well be a loser playing a death game, I guess. And maybe if I'm lucky, I can get some money. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's kind of how the, the ball gets rolling for it. Something I did notice was that like they changed the name of the ship, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, it's no longer the Espoir. Yeah, the Espoir, which is French for like hope. They changed mm -hmm. it to Destiny, which I thought was interesting because while the words are like similar, I feel like the context is different. Like you hear like, mm -hmm. oh, there's a gambling ship named Hope and you think like, oh, that's a sign maybe. Like my last ray of hope, here's this boat. But like destiny, that feels more like, you know, I'm destined to do this. Like this is, you know, something yeah. I have to do. It feels less hopeful and more like fate driven, which mm -hmm. thinking about it, I guess it fits this story a little better. But it was still interesting because I was just I I I kind of miss like the 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 kaiji narrator talking about the espuaru. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I do I do agree there. Uh, I do also think like it's kind of interesting how in this movie Kaisha's altruism almost sort of rewards him at the end. Like he mm -hmm. he gives the stars to Frida guy, but then like he gets off the boat. Whereas in the original series, it's like all right, now you gotta do all these other things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like well, you you made it off the boat, but uh, <laughs> you still have a lot of problems, my guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which, I mean, that kind of makes it more, like, self-encapsulated, which, you know, if they, if Animal World 2 never does come out, I, I'm satisfied with what we have here. It would be interesting to see where they would take it from there. 
Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, whatever happens, happens. Uh, but I've, I've enjoyed what I've seen, and I'm always looking forward to seeing more. I'd be curious to see if they keep up this whole, like, oh, Kaiji has a girlfriend, Mm -hmm. uh, because that would, I guess, make it a little easier for him to get into, like, another game. Like, oh, no, you want to get married, but now, like, you know, this thing happens with your wife. Like, oh, no, now I have to do another death game. Uh, And this time it's Death Pachinko or, you know, something. It is interesting how, like, this movie is the version of Kaiji that is not a sausage fest, like, it's still mostly dudes, <laughs> but there are, like, female characters in there. The mom, the girlfriend. Yes. Yeah, we have to try to make it, like, a, a little less gay, which I don't appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you know anything about Fukumoto fans, the, the BL in the uh, Fukumoto <laughs> fandom is very high and very good. Oh, yeah. Lots of stuff for the the old man lovers out there, the Oyaji lovers. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, uh, I think we're gonna gear into final thoughts. Uh, we'll start with Austin. Loyalty to the trailer means nothing in this animal world. Uh, good movie. I respect what it's doing. Back to you, Tim. Hell yeah. <laughs> Ethan, final thoughts. Really fun time. Uh, I don't have anything as good as Austin, but uh, I'm interested in looking into the Kaiji anime, and I hope we get to return to Animal World uh, sometime soon. Nice. Angie, final thoughts? I guess out of my experiences with this and other adaptations, I I determined that adaptations are just, in general, hard to make. Uh, (laughs) So uh, I, I think Animal World works because they did make the changes that they did. So I think overall it's a pretty fun time. And if you're open to checking out anime, I definitely highly recommend checking out what inspired this movie, which is Kaiji. All right, Dawn, final thoughts. I criticize this movie a lot, but like I said, it's because I love Kaiji, but I still welcome it with open arms into the Kaiji universe just because it is so weird and wild and out there that I just can't help but love it, especially Mm -hmm. considering like what Austin was saying about how (laughs) the director was like, here is my report on why you should let me make this movie. It's like, it's obvious that they really do love Kaiji and wanted to use a little bit of their own creative freedom to make something interesting. And I appreciate that. Also, I'm upset that they don't sell official Animal World Jan Campon cards because they look cool and oh, I yeah. would buy them. Absolutely. I would absolutely buy them. <laughs> So Netflix, while you're while you're taking notes on how you should make a second movie, because I said so, you should also be making Animal World merch for me to buy. Absolutely. Uh, I would totally buy a deck of those cards. My final thoughts, um, this is definitely a unique adaptation. It plays very fast and loose with the source material, but ultimately stays true to the heart of it. It's definitely a fun time. I would definitely recommend checking it out if you have any interest in what we've been talking about. I would also recommend checking out Kaiji. Uh, the manga is being printed by Dempa. They've printed three volumes so far, and uh, you can check out the anime streaming. Uh, you can stream it on Crunchyroll or High Dive, but don't stream it on Crunchyroll because they underpay the translators. Stream it on High Dive, mm-hmm. and they even have the first nine episodes dubbed, so check that yes, out. Yes, it's super over the top and great. It kind of reminds me of like the really good 90s dubs that were kind mm-hmm. of over the top and silly, but yeah. like in a really good way. Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody driving something like this is probably a scumbag anyway. So yeah, that's gonna do it for today's episode of Bomb Squad Movie Night. Uh, Thank you all for tuning in, and thank you to our two guests for joining us. Uh, Angie, do you have anything you want to promote? Unfortunately, no, but I I always appreciate coming on, so thanks for inviting me. Follow them on Twitter or something. I don't know. I'll put the Twitter (laughs) at... uh, Dawn, thank you once again for joining us. Feel free to plug your stuff. Well, thank you for having me. I had so much fun. You can find me and my podcast, The Anime Nostalgia Podcast, where we talk about older anime, manga, and fandom history from before the internet was such a huge part of our lives and how we consumed and enjoyed fandom. 
Uh, you can find that at animenostalgia.blogspot.com, as well as on pretty much any major podcast catcher or network. Just search for the Anime Nostalgia Podcast, and it's in there somewhere usually. And uh, if you want to see me on Twitter talking about all the weird stuff I like and occasionally posting pictures of my adorable kitty cats, uh, you can find me at Twitter at Bunny Cartoon, all one word. All right, so that wraps us up. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. Uh, if you're listening on any of the audio platforms, give us a review or a thumbs up or something. Uh, just interact with us, please. Uh, we, we just like to know that you're listening. And uh, if you you're watching this video on Spotify uncensored. Thank you for watching us with our naughty language. And <laughs> if you did watch us on Spotify, uh, we don't make much money off of that. So why don't you go down to our Patreon and uh, donate a little bit of money. We got some incentives coming soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. You might be able to get some exclusive content. Yeah, pull out those wallets, baby. Oh, yeah. And if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. Leave a comment below. Let us know. What do you think of Animal World? What do you think of Kaiji? What would you do if Michael Douglas pointed a gun at you? Let us know. And while you're down there, hit the like button if you like the video. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. And hit the bell icon so you get notifications for when we upload stuff. Tune in next week for our second annual Bomb Squad Awards show where we will be discussing the films of 2022 that we loved and appreciated. So we'll see you then. But until then, remember, in a high-stakes gamble, no time for flying around. Farewell. <laughs> <laughs> Your performance has been pitiful! <laughs>